Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Our Office of Child Care's webinar, uh, Payment to Provider Reporting Requirements in Eight-Hour Rule. Um, thank you for joining us, making time out of your very busy days. This is Tracy Gruber, the Director of the Office of Child Care. I'm going to kick off the meeting and then pass the time over to Ann Staka Mejia, who will go through the details in this webinar. Just a few housekeeping measures. You do have a dialogue box to ask questions, and we do have staff here that will be available to read the questions. Uh, questions that we determine are uh, applicable to the entire audience, we will take the time to respond to. Um, if there are questions that seem specific, please feel free to put them in the dialogue box. Um, but we and we will respond to them as we move on um, and put the Q and A, the question and answers online. Um, we are having some issues with the number of people who are allowed to listen to the webinar. We had a um, we thought that we were allowed to have up to a thousand people on the webinar. So if you know folks who are trying to get on and not able to, um, we're having a technical issue that um, only a hundred people are allowed to be on the webinar. And we're going to try to work that out. But we are going to be posting this webinar online after it's done and it will be recorded. And then we will send out that link to everyone. Um, to make sure that they have access to the webinar, even if they're not able to join us now. So just to provide some context to this webinar and why we're doing this. Um, many of you know that we started doing direct payment to providers for the cost, the subsidy for children in your care who qualify for child care subsidies. We started this in uh, two years ago. And that was because providers were expressing desire for payments to go directly to them rather than the parents. And then the providers, when it went to the parents, had the responsibility of getting those payments back. And after several years of feedback, uh, the Office of Child Care, the Department of Workforce Services, decided that it would direct pay providers. Well, like any policy changes and practices that we implement, there are often glitches. And one of those glitches is that many providers have uh, a significant amount of overpayments. And uh, a lot of that is because the direct payment that goes to providers gets immediately deposited in bank accounts. And before, when there was a, a card um, if the provider didn't take the payment off the card, the, the charges didn't go through. So if there were any problems with children in care and those types of issues, um, there weren't as many overpayments. So the Office of Child Care has spent the last, I would say, about year, year and a half, tracking the overpayments and trying to come up with procedures and policies that would help reduce the number of overpayments for child care providers. And that's really what this webinar and the next webinar is going to focus on, is what changes has the Office of Child Care made um, to the provider portal and to some of our policies to help providers reduce the number of overpayments that they have since we have moved to payment to provider. So that's some context for this webinar and the next webinar that's in November that we wanted you to have so you have some understanding why we have gone down this path. And we will be evaluating these new policies to see if, in fact, they have reduced the number of overpayments and to make sure that the system is working effectively, not only for the Office of Child Care, but more importantly, for you, the child care providers who are serving these families and ensuring that these children have access to um, a safe and healthy environment while they're in childcare. So with that, uh, again, you have a dialogue box where you can ask questions. So feel free to use that dialogue box. And I am going to pass the time over to Anne 
And again, thank you very much for joining us this morning for this webinar. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just quickly go through the agenda. Um, we'll be talking about some of the steps taken to reduce overpayments that Tracy's referred to. We will talk about um, and just review what the re reportable changes for providers are, including some tips to help providers. Um, there's some new portal reports and resources that I'll review. And then we're going to talk about some policy changes that are effective in November and the upcoming November webinar. So some of the things that we've um, done to help reduce overpayments is that we've added some questions as well as some informational um, text to the child care application instructing parents to talk to their provider and enroll their children before reporting a provider to DWS. We want to make sure that they've actually selected someone before we issue a payment to that provider and they, they don't know who that um, child is or that, that customer is. We've trained eligibility workers to call new providers before payments are issued. We've um, also educated parents to report changes in providers timely so that we can have time to stop the payment from going out and issue the payment to the correct provider for the following month. Now, all of these things um, don't always happen as planned, so it's just a continual learning process and education process. We've also made the ability for providers to report changes um, through the provider portal so that they can report changes electronically. We've provided provider flyers and overpayment tips and customer education. The four required reportable changes that providers must report um, and these are all changes that can be reported in the provider portal. The first one is a child stopped attending. This could be that they stopped attending any time in the current month or that you know that they've, they're have they not planning to return next month or that they've attended late, less than eight hours by the 15th of, of the month. The second change is that the child has never attended. So maybe they enrolled, but they just never showed up. The third one is apply a DWS credit to a case. This would occur if for some reason we didn't have your correct provider charge in our system and we over issued funds and the child is still attending the child care program, then we, you can enter a credit in the portal and then the, the following month's payment will be reduced by the amount that you report that you were overpaid by the department. And then the fourth one is to report a child care rate per child through the portal if you have a lower rate or a part-time rate for an individual child that's different than your monthly full-time rate and care about child care. Uh, when you do this one, you need to remember that the change is made effective for the following month. So if you uh, report a lower rate, and now you wanna go back to your care about child care rate, your full-time rate, you need to remember to go back into the portal the month prior that that rate is going to increase and then it will de set the default rate for the care about child care rate. To report changes in the provider portal, just a quick review, you go to the Children and Care tab, you click on Actions next to that case, and then you click on the change, one of those four changes that you are reporting, and then you follow the prompts to report that change. Now, last year we created a flyer that was um, tips uh, for providers that you could um, put next to your computer to reduce overpayments. Um, this is just a short, more condensed summary of that. Um, but you want to go to the Children in Care page regularly and review um, the cases and look at the children who's listed on each of those cases to make sure that um, the information is correct. And then watch for customers that are in a pending status. If it's pending, uh, I know that we don't give a lot of information because until the case is approved, we don't have that information to supply. But if, if that customer's name does not look familiar to you or you know that you don't have any uh, openings or that no one has contacted you, please contact the Office of Child Care 
so that we can research that for you. And if necessary, we can notify eligibility to uh, stop that payment from going out and notify the parent that they need to choose another provider or that they need to get in touch with you before we can issue that payment. And then also look for children who stopped attending or who have, a, who have had a schedule change. So full-time to part-time, um, you can um, see those in the view details section and then just be sure to report any changes by the 25th of each month or as soon as known, whichever, as soon as you know it, if it's before the 25th. We have some new resources that um, we wanted to review. So in the, re um, so we've got two new reports and you can, um, these will be available this weekend. So around October 15th, you should be able to go into the provider portal and see the new reports. Um, you can view them through the reports tab or the children and care tab. And so there's a monthly report and a historical report. And um, we've also updated some frequently asked questions in the DWS provider guide. Both of those will be available and updated in the portal effective November 1st. We're also working on additional reports that uh, we haven't um, released yet, or they're not quite ready yet, that we hope to be able to show you in the future. So first I'm, I'm going to um, kind of do a demo here of, I've got some screenshots to show of what the provider portal and what these new reports look like. So if you go to the children and care summary page on your portal, and scroll down to the very bottom. Go to the I want to section at the bottom of the children and care page. Um, again, this weekend you'll see view my monthly change history report summary and view my historical change report summary. We'll do the, uh, show you what the historical change report summary looks like first here. So you can, See that you can enter start dates and end dates for the time period that you're looking for. So you can do um, whatever time period you would like to see. Then you can um, select action type. So this one has all, all four of those reportable changes listed. And then if you have multiple facilities, you'll want to make sure that you select your correct facility that you're looking at. And then you can see below, you'll have the date reported, the case number, so that's the date that the change was reported, the case number, the parent's case name, the children that you reported that change for, or those changes if there's more than one, and then um, what type of change. And then if you entered any notes, which are optional, um, but when you report a change, it does give you that option to enter notes, they will be displayed here as well. And then if you have multiple users of the portal, you'll be able to see who actually reported that change for you. This shows a further breakdown of the historical change report. So if, if you don't want to see all changes, you really just want to focus in on one type of change, you can apply a credit. Um, that's one action type, and then those would come up. If you select never um, child never in care, then you would only see that action and so forth. So here's another one with the rate change, and it shows the amount of the rate change that, that was entered in the portal in the notes. And then here's one where the action type is um, child care stopped or the child no longer attending, and that one comes up. The other report is a monthly report. This monthly report will always default to the current month, and it will show all changes that have been reported in the current month. So you can sort. So if this is um, too much information here, um, and you want to just, you know, see everything, but you want to org more better organized, you can click on report cha reported change and it will sort by those four categories. 
or you can sort by um, date or, or case number or any of, of the headings up in the top row. We have some policy changes that are effective in November. So the current eight hour rule um, is that you have to provide care for at least eight hours per child by the 15th of the month. And this rule supports childcare providers by allowing the full payment to be applied to monthly business expenses and covering the cost of reserving slots for the month. The eight hour rule is not intended to pay based on enrollment only, and it's not intended to have a child attend one day or sporadically on a regular basis to receive the full monthly payment. Um, if that's happening, please contact the office. We do consider that a misuse of funds and we may need to relook at the parent's eligibility or um, make sure that we have her need posted correctly in our system if she has limited need for childcare. We're changing the eight hour rule a little bit. So we're revising it again. This is effective November 1st. The current rule still applies through October 31st. So starting in November, providers may retain the authorized monthly subsidy payment so long as at least eight hours of care were provided for the child by the 25th of the month or the change was reported. So you report that the child stopped attending or never attended by the 25th and then the child returns for eight hours by the end of the month. The reason that we're changing this, there's a few reasons. This allows for more situations that are beyond the provider's control. For purposes of determining an overpayment, it simplifies the process and results in reduced and fewer overpayments. Um, it's very important that your report changes by the 25th of the month of the current month, otherwise only eligible, you're only eligible to retain a partial payment for the actual hours in care if at least eight hours were provided. The reason that the 25th is so important is because um, since we do issue payments prospectively, the payments are released around the 27th, 28th of the month, depending on how the calendar lands. And so we need time to stop that payment from going out and preventing an overpayment for the following month that you'll have to return to us. There's no longer any exceptions. If a child has not attended eight hours by the 25th of the month, regardless of what the reason is, um, you need to report this through the provider portal. If, if you can't get into the portal, please email us at OCC at Utah.gov so that we can contact eligibility and help to take that action for you. Now, if the child does return after the 25th, so say that you reported a child was uh, stopped attending or was never in care, and then they return for eight hours after the 25th, there's not a way for you to report that through the portal that the child has returned. So please email the Office of Child Care so that we can uh, cancel that overpayment for you. Um, we may require a verification of attendance um, to show that the child did attend for the full eight hours or more and we may require that the parent contact DWS to determine eligibility for the following month and to confirm that you will be providing care again. The second change that's happening in November is a requirement to certify that attendance was reviewed. And this um, pertains to licensed providers, licensed family and licensed center providers must certify each month attesting that each case has been reviewed and reportable changes have been reported. The certification will occur between the 25th to the end of the month. It will be a requirement to re receive subsidy payments. Um, we believe that this will reduce overpayments and the risk of recurring overpayments over a multiple period of months. And this will also strengthen the integrity of the child care program to ensure that there's internal controls in place to, um, to prevent overpayments from occurring. So our next webinar 
will be held on November 2nd. Although this is geared towards licensed family and licensed center providers because of the new certification requirement, and we will be going into much more detail at that webinar about the policy and, and how that will work. And uh, we'll provide either a demo or screenshots of what, that, of what the providers will do. This is open to all provider types to, to join and to listen. Um, we've started out this process with licensed providers, but we may require all providers to do this at some point. So um, it would be beneficial for all providers to, to participate. So we're gonna turn the time over for questions. Um, if there are any questions, uh, in the meantime, um, I, while we're looking at those, um, there's some resources that I wanted you to see. So um, the first one is our website, the DWS provider portal is jobs.utah.gov backslash childcare. And um, this is where you can find those frequently asked questions. And there's also a link in there to the, the DWS provider guide that will be updated in November. The second one is jobs.utah.gov backslash OCC. This is our Office of Child Care website. If you click on provider resources, um, there's a plethora of subsidy information. We have our rates, our subsidy payment um, rates, and our income charts, and um, all of the flyers that we've mentioned are housed there, as well as the recorded webinars. So um, you can um, look at the webinars, the slideshows will be housed in that section in the provider resources page. And then of course, our email is OCC at utah.gov. That's our provider helpline. If you have any questions about today's webinar or if you need help accessing the provider portal or want more individualized help with reporting changes, we're glad to help you. So feel free to contact us. So um, are there any questions, Joe? Um, yeah, there's a few I didn't answer. <laughs> okay. Are there any that are, are relevant to the whole group that we can um, Yeah, we address? Have, we've got some really good questions. One of them is, we've had some very good questions. One of the questions is, when there is an overpayment, we get a statement with a dollar amount stating this is what we owe. There is not any information on what the client is from what client this is for so we can go after the parent for the money they owe or track on our ledgers and accounting who we are refunding we need a running ledger with customers and amounts to track these on our statements that's that's a really good request and i just answered that we'll discuss this with our pep unit um, to see if there's a way to put the customers information on the NAA, the notes that sent out. Okay. Okay. Um, the next one was, is it possible to make a change to the portal that allows providers to see the name and ages of the children when the case is in pending status? I said it may be possible, but it's something we have to address with our IT staff. Um, the next question I didn't answer, it says these reports are not available till the 15th, question mark. Correct, the, of October, this weekend. Yeah, that's correct. They're not available until the October 15th, this coming week. Yeah. Okay. Um, can this report be exported into Excel, historical change report summary? I said we're working with our IT staff to create a historical change report summary. Yeah, we've requested it be exportable. We've requested that both reports, well, particularly the historical report, be exportable to Excel. Um, I don't believe it will be available this weekend, um, but we have made that request that it be, um, that providers have that ability to export it. We've also made a request, one of the reports that I mentioned, um, I just mentioned that we have more reports. I didn't mention what they were. One of those reports is um, to have a report showing all of the children in care and their ages. So um, as Joe indicated, uh, we're not sure about 
uh, if we can do that for a pending application, that might require um, significant programming because um, it just depends how it comes over to our system. We can check into that, but we have made a request already um, to provide to give providers a list of all of the children in care so that they can see all of the children at a glance without having to click on every individual record to see which children are, are on a specific case. The next question, I was interrupted when you went over the certified part. Can you review it? Okay, let me go back to that screen here. So we will go into much further detail in, in the November training. Um, this is just a very high level overview of the certification process, but um, in starting in November, licensed providers uh, will start certifying in the provider portal each month, attesting that each case has been reviewed and that they've reported any of those um, required changes on that case. Um, the certification will, um, take place between the 25th to the end of the month. What that really means is that they will, um, you, the provider will certify one time or click on um, a statement saying that they've reviewed all of the cases. Um, they will do that once after they've actually reviewed all of the cases. It will be a requirement to receive subsidy payments. And we believe that um, by doing this, it will reduce the overpayments and the risk of recurring overpayments um, for months, for several months at a time. And this, of course, will strengthen the integrity of our program. But we will go into more detail about that in November and really get into the, um, the policy and the expectations of how that will work. Great, the next one. What if you have a client that leaves for vacation for a month, but plans to attend the month after? How does that work so the payment is issued for the month after? Well, if the it's the parent's responsibility to report changes. Um, so if they don't have a need for childcare for a month, they're required to report to eligibility that they don't need childcare. Um, and then um, it's also their responsibility. It's also their responsibility to report to us when they return to child care. Um, so um, you can, the, we tell the providers, you know, please keep us informed. You can email our office, but really it's the parent's responsibility um, when their need for child care changes. Right, so the provider will need to report, depending on when they're going on vacation, if it's for a full month and they're not there on the first day of that month, we need to know the previous month, the provider should report that in the report in the portal by the 25th that they've stopped attending. The parent should also contact eligibility to report that they don't have a need for care the next month. And then um, when they get back from vacation, they need to contact us to let them know so that we can reopen their case and then select the current provider at that time. The next one, can you please go over the number one child attendance for the 25th policy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll review this again. So the eight hour rule is changing slightly. So now rather than um, requiring that the child be in care by the eight hours by the 15th of the month, they need to be in care eight hours by the 25th of the month. So we've extended it, that rule, we're just lengthening it an extra 10 days. Um, if the change is reported by the 25th, so you so the child never comes even as of the 25th they're still not there the change was reported in the portal on the 25th and then next day they show up and they're there all day and they're there the rest of the month you can even though you reported that they stopped attending we will allow you still to keep the full payment for the month because you report it timely 
and they did return and, and you provided care for the eight hours. So there is no overpayment at all for that month um, based on that um, example. Um, and then if the child returns, so in that scenario, so that they do return after the 25th and you provide eight hours of care, there's no way in the portal to tell us that. You've already told us that you stopped, that they never attended, but um, now you need to tell us, hey, they're back, or they did come now for eight hours. The only way currently that we have to do that would be to email the Office of Child Care and let us know that I reported this change, but now they're here, um, they've been here for eight hours. We need to cancel that overpayment referral so that you don't get a letter saying that you owe money back. You don't owe any money back in that scenario now. So that's what has changed with this new requirement. Um, and so once you notify us, then we can stop that payment. We may, depending on the circumstances, ask for uh, verification of attendance in that last week. We may need to get into touch with the parent to find out has her need changed? Why is it that she only needs care at the end of the month or something like that? So Joe's asking me, what if they, what if the provider doesn't report by the 25th? If the provider does not report by the 25th that the child has stopped attending or was there for less than eight hours, I should say, or was never in care and, and it's not reported, and then they return for eight hours, we would only pay for the eight hours of care or the um, whatever it was, a minimum of eight hours through, through coverage through the end of the month. So our next one, do licensed providers have to attest to attendance for subsidy payments every month? Yes, they will. That will be a requirement. Um, our policy will say that it um, you can miss three and six months. Um, and again, I will go over that in November in November's webinar. So don't panic that, oh, what if I forget a month? Um, you know, we have built some buffers in place to um, so that you don't need to worry about that. But um, there are, are consequences if, if um, the provider doesn't certify for three months within a six month period. Okay. okay, the next one, can we possibly have status updates the pending applications in the provider portal, for instance, waiting on phone interview, waiting for employment documentation? Again, with this issue, it's an IT uh, programming um, that we need to check into to see if it's possible. That might be something that could, you know, happen in the future. Um, we'll put it on our list of requested items. We understand how important that would be to you to um, know that the pending application, the, pro the status of the pending, applica uh, pending application. Um, next one is there, a there. If there is a family of three children and one of them ages out, how do we determine the amount to be refunded for the one port for the one child? Does the portal allow you to report a change for just one of the children? Um, yes, when you uh, click on child not in care, it will list all of the children on that case, and then you will select the one child or as many children that are no longer attending and then you would report and it asks you for the last date in care so you would enter that information as well so it, it does allow you to um, report changes per child um, as far as the benefit amount uh, you would need to contact our overpayment unit um, for if you know they will send you a letter letting you know the amount of the overpayment so they would be the ones that would be best to work with um, to help you with that. We can provide in the Office of Child Care limited information, but we usually don't get into the calculations too much. We leave that up to the overpayment unit to, to work with you on, on those issues. Next question, how can we remove someone from our portal? I've reported children who no longer attend and they're still on our portal months later. No funds available, they're just still on there. Um, 
Um, so when a case closes, they will remain on the portal for an, a, an additional two months. And after that, the two months is up, um, they should be removed completely from your portal unless you click on you know, a 12 month history and then they would show up again. Um, but they shouldn't be there more than um, two months after you reported that change and it should show a zero benefit. So if you're seeing anything beyond that, um, let us know. The reason why it's programmed that way is because a lot of times cases will close for review or something else and then they, the case that end up reopening the following month or they reapply the following month. And so those cases will stay there for two months before they uh, will uh, be removed. Thanks. Next one. Is it possible to know how much funding is for each child? Sometimes there are children from different parents and it is hard to split an invoice is there, if there are different fathers or mothers for families. Unfortunately, at this point in time, it is not possible. Again, that's a valid request. We understand the importance of knowing that you are caring for, you know, five children and how much each payment is per child. And that is something that we can look at in the future um, as an enhancement for the portal. Um, at this point in time, we are unable to do that. Um, the next one is, can the children in care report can the children in care report have the amount per child and parent will pay? Again, it's the same issue. We understand the importance of you having this information um, and we'll put this request on our list for possible pro, uh, portal enhancements in the future. Um, the co-payment is there. The, the co-payment is there, just not the children. The, the breakdown. The children's breakdown, yeah. Um, let's see. I want to thank. <laughs> How do we know to report an overpayment if DWS only pays partial tuition? Example, if our tuition is 500 per month and we pay 300 of the tuition, but in actuality they only qualify for 100, so there was an overpayment of 100. How do we know to report an overpayment? if DWS only pays partial tuition. If our tuition is 500 per month and you pay 300, so that means there's a $200 balance that's owing to you from the parent, but in actuality, they only qualified for 100. So there was an overpayment of 200, there's an overpayment of 100. It, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they, the, again, the overpayment unit would be able to determine what they would have qualified for. So I think that would depend on what changed. I mean, if we pay 300, if your tuition is 500 and we pay 300, the balance of 200 is owing to you from the parent. So if our tuition is 300, but in something happened, and in actuality, they only qualified for 200, then there would be a $100 overpayment, but that would be calculated by the PEST unit when we find out why they were only eligible for 200. If you changed your provider charge from 300 to 200, let's say if that's what we paid it on, and we only paid 300, then there would be a $100 overpayment that could potentially be used as a credit. So I'm I'm not sure that we've addressed your question. Um, we would probably need a specific example to, yeah. to look at. Yeah, and say we need a specific example, and you can go ahead and send that question to the Office of Child Care, um, and we'll review it and see if we could be more specific in our response. Um, the next one. We don't click on each case. We don't click on each case monthly to see which children are being paid. So I have had time for a case review. Okay, wait a minute. We don't click on each case monthly to see which children are being paid for. So I have had times where a case reviewer has contacted me to see a child has attended in a family. 
and I didn't even know that state funding was that state was funding for individual children. Is it possible to have this showing where we know who it is being paid for? It's not the same question as children in care. We'll have a uh, we were. I think what will help with that because um, without looking at each individual record, I mean that is what's causing or create, creating overpayments because we're paying out and the provider doesn't realize that we are paying for a particular child on a case. Um, and so what we've requested is a report that will just show all of the cases and all with, with each child's name and age that you can run without having to click on each individual record. Um, and so you can scroll through that at a, at a glance or print that out and use that to best meet your needs to be able to manage um, those families better so that you know and you might see that there's you know a child that you're watching that's not even on the list you're you only have one sibling instead of two so you might notice you know you know, might need to contact us that we need to add a child or you will see children's names that you really that need to be removed so we'll make it more manageable for providers to be able to uh, re know to report changes with this report. Okay, next one. If a provider knows that a child will stop attending, but can see that the parent hasn't updated with us, does it stop the payment if the provider reports when they will stop attending? So this is a future so let's take that example of the parent going on vacation potentially or just stopping attending. If it's the, this is October, and let's say you know that in November the parent will stop attending and you report it today that they're going to stop attending, we will close the case based upon your report. It will close. So in that example, yes, by the fact that you reported it, it will stop the payment. So let's take that same example. Let's say that it's after the what, 28th or 29th of the month, or let's say it's the first of the month, and the parent didn't attend, and you can see that that payment was being issued. If it's towards the end of the month and it's already been processed for payment to you by the first of the month, and you report it to us, then it won't stop the payment. In order to stop the payment for the following month, the report has to be made to us by no later than the 26th or 27th of the month in order for that payment not to go out. If you're making the report from say the 27th to the first of the following month, for example, that payment will go out and it will have to be returned if you then report the child was stopped attending. I hope that answers your question. Um, we wouldn't know there was an overpayment because fall tuition. We wouldn't know there was an overpayment because fall tuition was not paid. Is this a follow-up to that question about um, the $100 and $200 scenario? If so, add it to the email um, that you're going to send off the child care so we can fully read it and understand um, your question and respond. Um, sometimes that happens though. Sometimes we don't know what the tuition is or what you're actually charging, especially when it changes from summer months to school months, the provider charge may change. If it, I will say that if, the, if that happens and you've reported that your charge is um, less for the fall month because of fall tuition and that child is still going to be in your care and you report the change in the provider charge, any overpayment that's calculated could be used as a credit against your following month's payment. So in that example, if they were, we paid 300 and your tuition ended up being 200, so there's a $100 difference that you know you were overpaid it's possible that when they report that to us, that we'll use that 100 as a credit 
against your payment the following month, then you wouldn't actually have an overpayment. So I hope we're understanding what your question is. But again, please um, send it to the Office of Child Care and we'll review it. If all this, if all this is a parent responsibility, then why do you not go after the parent for the overpayment? With the switch to payment to provider from payment to parent, it's, it's a philosophy shift. And so although the parents are still responsible to report changes, providers who receive direct uh, payments from the state of Utah also have responsibility as well to report changes. And so um, it, a parent could still end up with an overpayment if they were ineligible for the payment or committed fraud, even if they provided your services or you provided services, we would go after the parent. Um, we've made this as, um, uh, you know, fair as possible and, and to support providers that if you provided care for eight hours uh, in the month or by the 25th of the month, um, you can keep that full payment for the month. But if the care wasn't provided for at least eight hours and you're the beneficiary of that payment, then we need to collect the payment back from the provider. The next one. We find that many of our parents will get funding one month and then when the next month comes, their status is blank. The children are still attending, but we have no idea if funding will be available until mid-month or later. What does blank mean? Is it pending? So, um, I'm, if you mean like there's a zero payment showing, or um, sometimes you'll see a closed status with a zero payment, or it might even show open status with a zero payment for the following month. One way to check is to click on the details of that case and see if there's a review due. If it says that there's an October review, that means it's an October review for November benefits. Um, if it says it's a September review, uh, the September review was for the October benefits. And so if, there's, if it's showing zero this month in the month of October and there was a September review, it means that they haven't completed their review or turned in all of their verifications. Um, if it's not a review month, it could mean that they've reported a new job to us or a household change or they've applied for uh, food stamps or medical assistance that requires income verifications that could affect their their child care if they haven't turned that in timely for the other programs. And so there are times when if it's showing a zero benefit, most likely it means that they haven't provided something to us that was requested based on a change that they've reported or a late review. Okay, next one. Will OCC pay for children who attended daycare during the application process? but then was determined ineligible. Will OCC pay for that month? Unfortunately, no, we will not. Um, uh, once a parent applies for child care, uh, we go through the application process, and if they are determined ineligible for the subsidy payment, there is no way that we could possibly pay for that benefit. Um, remember, the contract is between you and the parent. Um, and yeah, we encourage um, when someone applies for child care to treat them like a private pay customer and require payment up front. Um, and then if they, they do get approved for subsidy, then they can, um, you can reimburse them for the amount of the, that the subsidy covers. They may still owe you out of pocket expenses or additional fees anyway. So by um, collecting a payment up front um, that somewhat secures you that, that if they do end up getting denied, um, they don't have this huge balance with you at, at the end of the month that you're trying to, that they're trying to come up with to pay you. Next one, how do we get a recording of this webinar and can we get a copy of the slides to refer back to? Um, this webinar is being recorded and, and it will be available online. It may take a few days for it to be posted online. 
Um, but on the on this um, last slide and called titled resources, the second one, jobs.utah.gov backslash OCC, click on the provider resources and then in the um, middle column on that next screen, can't think of what it's titled, um, you will be able to find recorded webinars and that's where it will be housed. Also, if you um, receive the flyer through Care About Child Care introducing um, this webinar, or if you log into the homepage on the provider portal, um, it will give you instructions about these webinars. The very last sentence says that the, um, that the webinars will be recorded and it provides the link directly to that page where you'll be able to find the webinar. The next one, what recourse do you have when a parent owes significant money and will not pay, aside from withdrawing the kids, which has already been done? Just like any private pay customer, I mean, you would be, your only recourse would be legal action um, against the parent. Unfortunately, we, there is nothing that we can do to help you recover those funds because it's a contract between you and the parent and we subsidize the parent's payment to you um, when they have an application with us and are eligible for the payment. But again, it, you would need to treat the subsidy customers just as you would treat a universal customer that owes you funds. Um, next question. When cases are closed because of extended vacation, et cetera, do the parent have to reapply and do everything that goes along with it to reopen their case? Parents have told us concerns about how hard and time consuming it is to initially apply. Um, I'll just give you a, a little tip on what happens when a customer's case closes, a bit of our uh, policy. If a customer's case closes, let's say at the end of October, Per our policy, they have 30 days from the date of that closure, essentially the following month, where they do not have to reapply for assistance. But in order to have their case reopened, they must comply with whatever request we were looking for that they, that they failed to do. So they have to resolve the closure issue by the end of the following month. So the case closes October 31st, they have until November 30th to resolve the closure issue, whatever reason it closed for. The benefits for November will be prorated from the date they resolve the closure. If they fail to resolve that closure by November 30th, they will need to reapply by December 1st. So that's your benchmark to have 30 days from the date of closure to complete, to, to resolve the closure issue. And depending on when they resolve it, those benefits may be prorated for November and they would have to reapply by December. Um, next one. Zero shows zero payment. Status is just blank. No review due. So zero payment status is just blank, no review due. We'll have to look at some examples to see why that happened. Yeah, we'll look at some examples. Can you send that? Um, send me the case, send us the case number. Send OCC the case number so we can take a look at it and find out what's going on and why it's showing blank with no review due um, on, in the portal. I have had times where it shows that the current month has an amount, but funds don't show on the report for the month as being funded. Does it mean that you will be paying for it but haven't done it yet? And if so, is there some way that you can let us know a date that it will be coming? Can you read that again? Okay, one more time. I have had times where it shows that the current month has an amount but funds don't show on the report for the month as being funded. Does it mean that you will be paying for it but haven't done it yet? And if so, is there some way that you can let us know that a date it will be coming? 
So it will show the following month's payment, and that month that payment will go out, you know, the end of the current month. If you're talking about the payment for the current month, um, it's possible that it was just issued that day um, or the night before. Um, that's the most likely scenario that I can think of. Um, and then once, so if it's just showing up today, um, but it's not showing in your account yet or on the transaction history yet, um, I, I, it should be in process of being deposited within um, two to three business days. So if it's anything other than that, you know, it could be a technical issue where the payment didn't go out or something like that. So we would need to look at that on an individual basis to make sure that you are receiving your payment. Because once it's there, you know, it, for the current month, it, it means that you should be getting that payment right away um, as soon as the bank can deposit it. Okay, next one. Could there be a countdown column added that lets the provider know how many days are left in a pending case? Or the number of days left for the caseworker to calculate the case. It could be an automatic countdown so the provider can say to the parent, it shows that there are three more days left for review. After that, we can charge them privately if it extends past the countdown time. Can we, we, could have, we could request it. Um, again, another suggestion. Um, it's something we can look at in the future enhancements but just a FYI for you, if you have a pending application and a date showing that pending application, um, the customer has 30 days in which to complete that application. So that might help. But they don't see the date either. Oh, you don't see the date either. No. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put that on our request for a report as well. <laughs> the date and the, the date. At, the, at least at the, the date least. they applied. Yeah, the very least. The date they applied and the date they reviews are 30 days. Whatever the month is, the review month has 30 days to complete that. So, good question. See, what do I know? Um, next one. If a parent reports hours, their children will be in care, but then the hours increase during the month and more money is needed to cover their increased hours. Is there anything the parent can do to increase their amount being paid to provider for a current month after that month has started? Absolutely. If a parent has increased their hours, um, all they need to do is report it to the case manager, case worker, report it to our office that they have increased their hours. And if they have increased their hours for employment in the current month, then those increased hours are expected to continue the following month or if we're paying for training if they've increased their training hours all they need to do is report it and if it's the uh, increase that is expected to last we can supplement the current month but the increase in hours must be reported um, and if it's a substantial change we'll absolutely supplement it in the current month reporting is always essential um, comment I appreciate the new system. It's been so much better for us as providers than it used to be. Thanks for thinking of providers. Well, thank you everyone for participating and for your excellent questions. We do um, want to uh, support you as much as possible and appreciate your hard work. Um, we will continue to look at more enhancements to the portal to give you the the tools and the resources that um, you've requested and see what, if, if there are changes that we can make. Um, we are out of time. Um, so again, um, the next webinar is on November 2nd at 1030. Um, if you're not able to join, it will be recorded just as this one is and you'll be able to um, watch it at your convenience. Thank you again for your participation.